Welcome to this fourth episode of Research Insights Live. Welcome to our online audience joining from various corners of the world, India, Ethiopia, and Brazil, amongst others. And welcome also to our live audience joining us today here in the Hague Humanity Hub. So this event is organized by ISS, the International Institute of Social Studies. We are a graduate school of critical social sciences, part of Erasmus University uh, and based here in The Hague. Today's episode, we're broadcasting from The Hague Humanity Hub, the vibrant The Hague Humanity Hub, I must say, a space that brings together the peace and justice community in The Hague and beyond. We hope that new connections can be made, new conversations can be initiated, and knowledge can be exchanged as we talk today about the impact of the war on global development challenges worldwide. It's been almost 500 days, 491 to be precise, since Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February, 2022. And the war has dominated headlines ever since, with the world witnessing the violence, destruction, and devastation with great apprehension and shock. Meanwhile, the impacts of this war are far-reaching. Our increasing interconnectedness means that conflicts and their consequences decreasingly respect borders, with the ripple effects of this war continuing to reverberate around the world. But what are the implications of this war for global development? That's our focus for today. So first, some practical issues before we dive into the content. Um, this event is being recorded um, and will be put online. Also, photographs will be taken by my colleague Barbara, who's standing in the back of the room. Um, if you have any objections, you should have indicated that already. And if not, there is a media-free or a safe zone, if you will, in the back of this room um, that my colleagues can show you. Secondly, we're also very curious about your insights and your reflections. Um, so we invite you to engage both the live audience and the online audience. For the online audience, my colleague Rhiannon is moderating the chat. Um, so please do share your questions and comments in the chat as we progress, because we'll try to take questions on um, throughout uh, the different presentations. Um, also, a kind reminder to keep your questions and comments short, and if possible, to indicate to whom they are addressed. So, back to the content. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Adinda Seelan. I am a knowledge broker and research communications advisor at uh, the ISS. I have the pleasure of moderating today's event, uh, Conflict Compoundant, the Implications of the War in Ukraine on Global Development Challenges. And we've broken the program up into three different segments. So the first segment is going to be about the international dimension of the war, focusing in particular on the impact on the liberal international order and geopolitical changes. Secondly, we're going to zoom in on the ripple effects of the war on international development. And last but not least, we're going to take a country-level perspective and hear about the impacts of the war in Sri Lanka. Initially, we had wanted to have a fourth perspective here, namely that of humanitarian and development organizations. But unfortunately, our speaker had to pull out of this event last minute, but rest assured, there's still plenty of content for us to cover here with three speakers on board. So, that leaves me one thing to do, which is to introduce to you the three speakers who are next to me, who will be sharing their critical and cutting-edge insights on uh, the impacts of this war on global development, where we stand today, uh, but also some reflections for the future. So, on my left is Professor Will Houts. Um, Will is Professor of Governance and International Political Economy at ISS. And next to Will, we have Dr. Anna Visser, Associate Professor in Agrarian Studies. Um, and to my very left, we have Dr. Shamika Jayasundara Smits, who is Assistant Professor in Conflict and Peace Studies. Welcome to you all. So, let's get started. Um, we're going to kick off today with Professor Will Hout. So, welcome again. And, oh, is your mic um, operating? Just checking? Yep, yeah, okay, good. Welcome again. Um, you're going to paint the broader picture uh, today and discuss the international dimensions of this war. Um, maybe the first question, because the starting point of today's discussion is the war in Ukraine, uh, which is the largest conflict in Europe since the Second World War. Um, we've got some facts here. Can you shed some light on the direct impacts um, of this war on the more than 42 million Ukrainian people? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think the, um, the direct effects are displayed here uh, very clearly. Uh, there are so many people displaced, uh, there are many refugees, uh, people of course are in need of assistance, uh, the amounts of money that would be required for the reconstruction of uh, infrastructure 
um, in Ukraine is immense. Uh, the World Bank uh, recently estimated that to be over 400 billion uh, US dollars. Um, so, yeah, these are the, the most direct uh, consequences of, of the war. Um, I would say, and you, well, you invited me to talk also about the international consequences. I think uh, what is one of the immediate fallouts is on the, um, what we call the, the liberal international order. Uh, the liberal international order is a is shorthand for uh, the, the order that existed since uh, the Second World War, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm coming from the discipline of international relations, so we call order anything that is uh, displaying some regularity. And so disorder is part of the order. It's a bit paradoxical, but that is how it is. Um, but one of the bases, one of the key definitions of this international order is that it is a rules-based order and that it is based on principles of international law. And I would say that next to, obviously, the, the victims in Ukraine, uh, the, the, the rules-based order, the international law dimension of uh, our international system has been one of the victims uh, of that um, uh, of that war, uh, primarily also because one of the principles is um, the, the non-aggression uh, uh, non and, and, uh, and autonomy and sovereignty. And, and these, of course, have all been um, uh, violated very clearly uh, in um, uh, early 2022. Uh, because one of the principles actually behind the um, independence of Ukraine, which dates back only uh, 30 years or so, was that its existence within borders uh, recognized in uh, 1995 would be uh, respected. Now, right. And that is, of course, something that has been violated very clearly uh, with this uh, invasion, first, uh, of course, in 2014. Uh, of, uh, of Crimea and the annexation of Crimea, a fake referendum that was set up, later the um, uh, attacks in the eastern Ukraine, and now a full-blown attack uh, on the whole of the country. Right, yeah. And you're also saying we're transitioning now a little bit from a unipolar to a more pluralistic uh, world order where different principles are embraced. Um, and that you know, Putin's framing of this war is yeah, also leaning towards that direction. Can you maybe elaborate a bit more on that point? Uh, yeah, that's a difficult question. I mean, we are, of course, now in the midst of, of this situation. So where, where we are heading is very uncertain, uh, I would say. Uh, there are many speculations of people of uh, new alliances being uh, made. Uh, we've seen, of course, uh, at the uh, Winter Olympics in, in Beijing that there was a high-level meeting between the Chinese president and the uh, Russian president, where uh, they declared something like a, a no uh, limits friendship between the two countries. But uh, for those of you who might have read a very interesting uh, piece uh, interview uh, with Henry Kissinger on the occasion of his 100th uh, birthday uh, in The Economist a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, he said, but deep down, there is no friendship between China and Russia. Deep down, they actually, um, they, they, well, I wouldn't say they're afraid of each other, but they're certainly not, not friends. And I think that is one of the uncertainties that we're facing at this moment. Yeah? Because we could think, okay, there was this declaration. We've seen, of course, all kinds of new alliances springing up. But what will be the end result of that at this very moment is unclear. Uh, it could very well be that uh, with maybe the balance uh, turning against Russia, and of course many people hope, but we, uh, we have to wait and see whether that is going to happen, uh, the, the position of China might actually be different from that what was expected in February 2022. Uh, it's, after all, this is uh, power politics that we're talking about, and alliances are not set in stone. Right. Uh, so in that sense, I think we're, we're, we're heading to also an uncertain future. Yeah. And in an in op-ed that the Dutch Prime Minister wrote earlier this year, he called Russia's invasion a watershed moment in world history. And 
one that concerns all people and governments, uh, beyond those of the West and Russia. Can you maybe shed some lights on how countries are positioning and repositioning themselves beyond China? Um, yeah, well, that's, uh, that, that, that was an interesting quote, uh, in a sense. It's, of course, that's easier said than done, but I mean, he's a historian, yeah. so he should know about watershed moments. And yeah. of course, also that we only will know what the watershed moments are when we are looking uh, behind us. Yeah? Yeah. So that, that's, of course, uh, a caveat. Uh, but what I think how we have been seeing is an attempt um, of, of yeah, China, Russia, uh, to, to change some of the principles of this uh, international order towards, um, let's say, more unilateral principles uh, that would benefit uh, uh, these powers. And what we've seen in, in a broader perspective is that the, um, well, first of all, of course, we've seen that in the United Nations, uh, which is the, the, the apex body in the multilateral order at the, at the moment. Uh, there were two resolutions tabled, one immediately after the start of the war, the other one, I believe, that was in October 2022. And uh, on, on both occasions, a vast majority of the member states of the United Nations uh, voted for a resolution condemning uh, the invasion uh, in Ukraine. Um, and the, the second one also uh, named the uh, annexation of the Crimea and the uh, aggression in eastern Ukraine illegal. Uh, so they really adopted the, framework, uh, the, the, the words of uh, legality. Uh, so that is a very stark reference to the principles of the international order. Having said that, if you look closer, then you see that certain important countries did not concur with uh, the majority. Uh, so overall, I think it was about 130 or 140 uh, member states voted in favor of that resolution. By the way, General Assembly resolutions are not binding unlike the Security Council, and that's where Russia, mm -hmm. as one of the permanent five members, blocked Vetoes. a decision. Right. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, it's a good signal that uh, a vast majority of the international community uh, condemned. But, as I say, there were a couple of countries abstaining. And interesting, in, this, in that list of around 30 countries were India mm -hmm. uh, and South Africa. Brazil at that time voted for the resolution, but uh, under Lula, the current president, uh, it's, still, it's a bit more undecided whether Brazil would want to take uh, or would want to support initiatives like this in the framework of the United Nations. But I think that um, signals a potential uh, rupture in the international community that uh, places some important countries uh, yeah, we, well, we don't know where we should place them, but they're, they're certainly undecided, but they're not uh, full-fledged... Uh, uh, there's no full-fledged condemnation of, uh, of Russia. So I think that's where you see potential breaks in the, uh, yeah, in the international uh, community. Yeah. And, of course, recently we've seen uh, President Ramaphosa of South Africa leading a delegation of a number of <clears throat> African uh, leaders uh, visiting Moscow and uh, Kiev uh, in an attempt to maybe somehow mediate between the two parties. But also that was very clear uh, both when they were there and when they were back in their respective countries that they did not have really much to offer. And also, let's say, the ideological uh, gravitas that they represent is, yeah, I would say, is, is, is minute. Yeah? So, so that is uh, also a wake-up call, I think, for, let's say, the non-aligned uh, countries in the world. Right. Yeah, that's, um, that's clear, much to reflect upon and think about. Um, thank you for sharing this political perspective um, for the international consequences. But of course, this war also has far-reaching economic consequences. And I was wondering if you could briefly shed some light on those as well. 
Um, yeah, I think everybody has, has witnessed, of course, the uh, immediate uh, consequences uh, as shortage of, uh, uh, well, that's not maybe so much here, but uh, we, we've had a hike in energy prices, but across the world a, there was a shortage at one stage of um, uh, of wheat and, and, and uh, etc. Due that to sanctions. Yeah, and, that's yeah. exported from Ukraine and also the unavailability of the harbors right. uh, on, the, on the Black Sea. Now, had that, there was a, a, a deal negotiated and that seems to have worked. It was continued a couple of times, so that has seemed to have worked. But yeah, these are, of course, uh, very important uh, consequences uh, for uh, many countries around the world. Right. And um, yeah, with energy prices rising and then falling a little bit, of course, with uh, the winter uh, uh, of 2023, when the war would still be going on, uh, we don't know what what would be happening uh, at that stage. So, so these consequences can indeed be quite uh, important. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for painting the broader picture for us today to get the conversation started. Um, and for shedding some light on the potential changes that are happening and the insecurities or the unknowns really uh, that come with that. I want to give the audience the opportunity to ask some questions and engage, but before I do that, I quickly want to look over towards the other two speakers who are here today to see if you have any additions, reflections or comments that you'd like to share. Good, okay. In that case, I want to ask Gabriella, who is managing the mic today, to come forward. Is there anybody in the audience that has a question at this stage for Will and some of the points that he's raised? I see a hand. Um, my question is uh, whether um, we can think what might be the reason for some of these countries not to align themselves. Um, because on in one hand, we could think of uh, not wanting to upset Russia or not wanting to take a position, but also perhaps uh, their own intentions in the future of what they might want to do and whether it's wise for them to condemn a country taking some actions. So I was wondering, what do you think, what might be the reasons for them not to align and not to condemn Russia? Yeah, I, I think, well, what, what you're saying, I think that's, that probably is one of the um, important reasons, uh, the, the economic relations between uh, different countries and Russia, uh, uh, as, as suppliers of certain um, uh, goods, not least military goods. Uh, it's, it's very well known that, of course, there are supplies from uh, a host of countries to, uh, to Russia. Um, but maybe uh, in a more, let's say, ideational uh, domain, there's also the, um, the fact that some countries are maybe not so convinced uh, of, the, um, yeah, of the legitimacy of the liberal international order. Uh, because what you often see as a comment is, yes, this is a rules-based order, but it's been a US rules-based order since uh, the 1940s. And I think that if you look at many of the international institutions, it's, it's very difficult to get away from that. Uh, so if, if we hear, of course, about the International Monetary Fund, uh, which is one of the uh, uh, central institutions of the post-war international order, um, and the, the difficulty there is to give a broader representation in, in decision-making, um, particularly to, to important countries in the Global South, including India. And then, then we recognize that there might be an element of, um, of dissatisfaction there, uh, to put it diplomatically. Uh, it, the situation in, in, in these international organizations is, is rather simple. Uh, there is a blocking minority held by the US. And as long as that doesn't change, and as long as there are no uh, serious uh, changes on that front, I think that uh, sort of resentment uh, will remain also with the functioning of important international organizations. So maybe at a, in, a longer, uh, in the longer term, 
discussions that have been going on now for at least 30 years about the share of the votes uh, in the international organizations, including, by the way, the UN Security Council, might get underway. It might be that uh, finally there is a recognition that the fact that some of the countries that uh, were among the... Um, um, that were in the successful alliance after the end of the Second World War, still in the Security Council, and I mentioned France or the UK, uh, they might be replaced by other countries that are much more populous, that have a much, more, a much higher economic weight. Uh, right. India, for instance, has now been uh, said to be the, the largest country in terms of population. Right. It's number five uh, in terms of economic power. So maybe it would be time to think of those kinds of changes and also change the, the voting structures uh, in these organizations. It would maybe enhance the le legitimacy of international organizations that, and to come back to the point, are now seen to be still mu very much part of that US-based uh, world order. Yes, it's a discrepancy between these international organizations and our real reality. Um, perhaps. Yeah, we're 80 years yeah, after yeah. the end of the uh, uh, Second World War. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Will. Um, I'd like to move on to the next segment now. Um, so this second, second segment, we're still going to keep the international gaze, but the focus is going to be more on the compounding effects of the war on international development and on existing crises, such as the cost of living crises and the food crises. But we also want to pull out some of the lesser heard stories um, from the shadows of this war. And so for this segment, I am joined by Dr. Ona Visser, um, who has conducted extensive research on food and land in Ukraine and Russia, amongst others. So welcome again, um, Thanks. Ona. Um, Will has already talked about a number of the features uh, of this conflict that render it a critical moment in history. And I wanted to ask if you have any additions from the perspective of international development on what makes this war a game changer. Yeah, aside from that, a lot of uh, countries are kind of uh, forced to to position themselves in terms of the the conflict. Yeah, uh, there are two uh, major um, uh, global consequences in my respect. One is that um, those countries, uh, Ukraine and and Russia, have a very big uh, uh, share in uh, in some key. Uh, products, yeah, globally, uh, like oil and gas from from Russia. Um, uh, also, fertilizers comes from uh, a large share yeah, comes from Russia and also Belarus. Uh, so they are affected by the sanctions, um, and then of course food. Um, We've probably uh, seen in the news that um, what we did, most of us didn't realize that those countries ha have a huge share in in crops like. Uh, like wheat, like sunflower, uh, together Russia and Ukraine cover almost 30% uh, of a global wheat supply. Uh, so that has uh, uh, great uh, consequences, far-reaching consequences. Uh, of course, we, we saw it in, in the Netherlands already in the, in the supermarkets where suddenly there on the shelves there was some sunflower and prices went up. Uh, but uh, countries in the global south, uh, low-income countries are affected uh, way more still at, uh, till the moment. And the second um, element, uh, I think it's key, uh, it, it was already hinted to by, um, by Will Hout, is that um, conf it is not only a conflict uh, for those directly involved, but it, uh, the conflict also uh, penetrates in the global organizations, international organizations. Um, it's um, not only the voting power, but also within uh, UN organizations themselves. For example, if we look to the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, uh, currently there is a Chinese uh, Secretary General, and um, he, in line with uh, the, the Chinese policy, he uh, hasn't used the, the word war to refer to Ukraine. He talks about uh, conflict, and uh, in response, a lot of Western um, uh, governments have responded that he have tried to push him to take a more um, pronounced stance, and he has refused that. Um, there were also protests by Ukrainian uh, uh, citizens in front of the FAO uh, headquarters in, in Rome to, to, to ask for Russia to be uh, uh, expelled from the organization. Uh, 
and we see that uh, wider Chinese policies are uh, kind of uh, resonating in the standpoint of the Secretary General. Yeah? For example, uh, over the past decades, uh, civil society organizations, farmer organizations, they got a, a bigger voice within the FAO. Yeah? Not only companies and governments, but also citizens. And uh, that is the, sec uh, the Secretary General currently is trying to yeah, downsize that, uh, that influence. So that the effect is that this organization gets less effective. Yeah? Uh, so uh, a lot of com uh, governments complain that uh, the FAO hasn't been very proactive with addressing the food crisis, especially within Ukraine. Uh, so the conflict penetrates into uh, international organizations. Right. That's very interesting. And um, you already mentioned that they're becoming less effective, but are there also other implications of this war for development financing uh, for the broader field in that way? Uh, yes, you see also that uh, now as a consequence of both uh, COVID and now uh, the war effects, that a lot of low-income countries uh, have become very indebted, way more than they were three years ago before COVID and the war. Um, on top of that, we see that interest rates are now rising, so those debts are becoming, they are uh, weighing heavier on the shoulders of those countries. And um, uh, we see that uh, normally, uh, until a few years ago, uh, when uh, countries were really in a deep crisis and able to pay back those loans, that uh, all the donors uh, were gathering together in the Paris Agreement and discussing uh, a certain haircut to, to downsize the debt, yeah? Uh, and then that, that required some collective action because uh, if everyone wants uh, his or her uh, uh, loan back in full, then it doesn't work, yeah? It, it, it requires some solidarity. So that worked to a reasonable degree, but now China uh, is not part of those uh, deals. So um, there is a risk that then other organizations also think like, oh, if China wants the full loan back, why should we give some discount on, on the debts to those countries? So that uh, is another danger. Uh. Yeah. And we've also seen at the country level, uh, so for example, the budget for De Dutch Development Corporation, uh, there was a risk averted because it was going to be reduced, right? Um, because of the cost for housing asylum seekers in the first year and the costs were rising, so they were going to take that from the development corporation, corporation budget, but fortunately that was averted. But yeah, so we're seeing that also on the country level. Um, but I want to go back to your point about the consequences of this war for food security and poverty around the world. Um, Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world, let's refer it to that way. So obviously this war has repercussions for food security and I thought I would quickly share the figure also that you shared with us and maybe you can shed some light on that. Uh, yeah, we see that um, exactly uh, Ukraine and Russia are the major uh, providers of, of grain and wheat uh, to a, a whole range of uh, low and middle income countries yeah? and especially some of the uh, vulnerable ones like Somalia, Benin, uh, you see that they have huge shares of the wheat coming from um, uh, Ukraine or um, Russia, uh, but also a country of Egypt, uh, the biggest uh, wheat importer in, in the world. Uh, and then you see, of course, Sudan in a crisis and very dependent uh, next to that on, on those imports. Um, so there is a, a strong correlation that uh, a lot of our wheat comes from the US, comes from France, but exactly those low-income countries get their wheat from those countries. And um, uh, you see that um, they have a, also a weak bargaining position to get this, that grain and that wheat on time, uh, because of course Western countries, some, uh, Japan, some countries, uh, high-income countries can uh, negotiate, offer better prices. Um, uh, so, uh, especially the smaller of those low-income countries, they are kind of last in line for those deals for wheat. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, so is, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I, I don't think this is the full story, right? So, you think it's really important to shed light on some of the other factors that are driving the food crisis today. Um, and to share some of the lesser heard stories from the shadows of this war. So can you tell us what these stories are that we should be talking about more often? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I guess you heard a bit about uh, the effect for low-income countries in terms of food, but uh, I want to point out two uh, lesser heard stories and I think important implications, one for Ukraine and one for the, 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 the world. Um, to, to, to first to look at the world, um, we see that um, in the media um, discourse, the policy discourse, we see uh, the same kind of um, causes for this food crisis uh, constantly being repeated. Yeah, the war itself, um, uh, the, the, the lingering effects of, of COVID, yeah, with disruption of all kinds of uh, chains, uh, of, of uh, global value chains, and, and, and to some extent climate change, like the drought in the Horn of Africa. Yeah? Uh, but what is hardly mentioned is the, the role of, of uh, speculation in, in driving up food prices. And I think that definitely is a very substantial uh, part of the story. Uh, here we see on the screen, uh, we see a graph, we see the, 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 uh, the profits of the, the key, the 10 largest uh, transnational food traders. And we see already, even you don't have to look in much detail, you see that the, 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 the line is going up. Yeah? The profits have, have gone up already during COVID. It went already up, yeah, 2001. And then 2002, it went up further during, uh, during, uh, due to the war, of, due to the war in the context of the war. Yeah? So what we see is that um, there is a, a lot of speculation going on. Uh, already when um, the, the rumors uh, were there that uh, Russia would invade, a lot of uh, 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 food traders already started to quickly buy up food, yeah? uh, already driving up the prices, and that accelerated right after. And um, they were hoarding uh, some of those uh, stocks, and the meanwhile waiting for prices to, uh, to go up before they uh, were s sold on. Um, hey, you had a figure you shared yeah. uh, with us. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here is a quote uh, from an um, uh, um, NGO report by Unearthed. And um, it states that a group of 10 leading momentum-driven yeah, uh, hedge funds, so would grasp the moment, yeah, the opportunity, <laughs> um, have made an estimated 1.9 billion, not million, billion uh, um, on uh, profit on food sp uh, price hikes and spikes at the start of the Ukraine war, uh, which of course drove millions of people into hunger. So we look at the damage done, but it's also good to look at who benefits, yeah, who profiteers from, uh, from the disaster which is, uh, is going on. And then, um, let's see, where we did we have another slide? Yeah, so let's go on to uh, Ukraine. Uh, so one um, hidden story, I would say, uh, in terms of what is happening for implications uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and here we see a title of a report which was published. It's called War and Theft. That you may maybe think about Russian troops uh, stealing, and that's definitely happening, and it's uh, very very uh, sad uh, story, but at the same time there is also another theft going on, a land theft, land grab, that is uh, that um, currently, um, or let me say, uh, until uh, recently, it was not possible to, to sell land, yeah? the, uh, farmland. Yeah? And um, already uh, in the 90s, a kind of law was proposed to, uh, to uh, uh, enable uh, farmland to be sold, but farmers uh, were widely against it. Yeah? Uh, there have been surveys done that definitely about two-thirds of the population roughly is against uh, freeing of the land market because they are afraid that uh, yeah, land would be bought up by foreigners, by the big uh, Ukrainian oligarchs, and farmers would uh, uh, lose, risk losing the land. Um, so this, this law uh, to, to free the land markets has been constantly been proposed for decades. There has been a lot of opposition, there have been protests. Uh, but exactly during COVID, during a lockdown when no one could go on the street to protest, uh, the law was finally put in place. Actually under the pressure of Western donors who wanted privatization, liberalization as much as possible. 
Uh, so people were, are in shock now during the war. And uh, next year, in ge on January, the uh, next phase of this, wall, uh, this law uh, goes in force. So first it was only possible to sell around 100 hectares. Uh, but next year it is uh, possible in one go to sell 100,000 hectares of land. So that is like 1,000 uh, or 500 uh, Dutch farmers on average in one go. Uh, so we see that uh, the West is actually pushing um, uh, this agenda. And um, I have a quote here of a one um, Ukrainian researcher uh, who together with NGOs were protesting, and I spoke with some of those NGOs. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, like, um, what is happening that uh, our girls and, and boys are fighting to defend our land yeah, against uh, foreign aggression. And at the same time, our land is being sold out yeah, to, to foreigners. Uh, and, and everyone is too much in shock to really realize that. Yeah? So that's, I would uh, refer to the work by Naomi Klein in 2007. It's called Disaster Capitalism. And she describes how during moments of disaster, uh, uh, key investors and governments push through uh, very unpopular reforms, which are normally would be protested by civil society. She so gives examples from Iraq, where the huge... Uh, reforms of the schooling system, etc., pushed through, but also during uh, the disaster of Katrina, the hurricane in New Orleans, that suddenly far reaching reforms were pushed through, which no one would otherwise agree to. But people were in shock, and I think this is a good description of what, uh, what is happening. Yeah. And, you know, jumping on that point of private sector engagement, just last week there was the Ukraine recovery conference that took yeah. place um, in the UK. Um, and reading the uh, website of the event, it said specifically the event was working towards international investment to rebuild Ukraine, um, and that it also sought to explore how to unlock the potential of, private, of the private sector to help in Ukraine's recovery, um, amongst other things. Um, at the same time, in Will's presentation, we saw that the World Bank has estimated that we need at least $411 billion dollars um, to rebuild Ukraine. So that's an enormous amount. In this era where we talk about partnership um, and shared responsibility, do you think the private sector should not play a role then? Or how do you think this can be approached in such a way, uh, in a balanced way, that it doesn't come at the expense um, and the stakes of the Ukrainian people? Um, so I think uh, definitely there's nothing wrong with uh, a lot of money from the private sector coming in. Uh, but uh, it's very much about the conditions under which that's uh, being done and who, uh, who sets the agenda for, for that money, where does it go and in, in what way. And, and that is what's worrying me because um, I think um, this uh, Recovery Ukraine conference but, uh, is a sign of that and also the fact that uh, Zelensky presented a new initiative on the stock exchange in, in New York. Uh, which is almost uh, a complete sell-off of, of Ukraine uh, for uh, a race to the bottom, yeah? Uh, super investor-friendly. Um, and um, we see that uh, also companies have a strong, investors have a very strong influence on how this looks like. The population is in war, they are not, not participating. While now in a really a rapid pace, all kinds of reforms are pushed through. So my worry is that after the shock of war, and hopefully at some moment there will be peace, there will be another cold shower for the population because the social welfare system, the economy they were used to, is not, will not be there anymore. Uh, so that is right. the problem. Who sets the agenda? And uh, that should be democratically controlled, uh, in my view. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for um, shedding light on the repercussions for international development for shedding light on the existence of layered crises, really, um, and for highlighting some of the systemic shortcomings um, that, un uh, that lie beneath the surface, really. Um, again, I want to invite you to engage, but before I do, looking at Vil and Shamika to see if you have any additions, comments, reflections on Ona's input. Shamika? Uh, in the next segment, I will somehow type what Orna will say, and also will. Well, maybe one, uh, one 
comment, uh, that would be on the, um, let's say, the connection to the multilateral uh, dimension. Uh, after the Second World War, had the World Bank, officially known as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, was created. And this would, of course, this would, of course, be a, an excellent opportunity uh, for a reconstruction and development bank to step in again and make that connection to the multilateral dimension of the international order and not just leave that to uh, private finance uh, to do that. Yeah, I totally agree. Because if you uh, uh, look back at the Marshall Plan uh, after the, the, the World War II, yeah, with the, the funding, uh, uh, the help, help from the US, uh, primarily for rebuilding Europe, um, now, uh, the, 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 um, since the war Marshall period, uh, never the US invested so much in Europe, now, uh, namely uh, Ukraine. Uh, but the conditions on, on which this is done, it's very different, yeah, from states uh, determining to the, basically almost the, the, the private sector in the driving seat. And I think that is uh, um, a big difference. And then there, one argument is often like, okay, yeah, but the governments uh, have not that much money and uh, there's a lot of money in the private sector. Uh, but I think that's not a reason. Then you should uh, start taxing corporations rather than asking uh, corporations to, to come in. Because what we need is democratic control for this protest, for this process of reconstruction. Right, some more democratic control. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I'm going to check quickly whether there is a question online. Apologies. Right. So we have a comment here. Um, from the online audience, Libby has pointed out that the agenda setting at the UK conference was very patriarchal. Um, how can discussions around recovery become more intersectional and inclusive, particularly in the realm of gender, is the question that was asked. Um, I can uh, start and maybe someone else can uh, join in. Uh, I think um, um, that there is a lot, uh, this lack of intersectionality has a lot to do with what I mentioned is focus on um, on the private companies. As we know, a lot of the boardrooms are old boys networks. And, and just by bringing in civil society, you could also bring in much more uh, the gender perspective. Yeah, Then you can really work on like uh, equal representation according to the, the, the key criteria, like, uh, like gender, age, etc., uh, ethnic groups. Uh, but that is, yeah. There is, uh, on, the f on the surface, it is there in the rhetoric in, in this conference, uh, but uh, in my opinion, it's, it's really marginal. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking at the time. There will still be room for questions and answers towards the end of uh, the session, but I'd like to move on to our third speaker. Um, so we've spoken about ex extensively now about the international ramifications of this war. And we now want to transition our gaze from the international level to the national level, and more specifically to an island country in the Indian Ocean, <laughs> Sri Lanka. So how has the war in Ukraine affected a small and vulnerable country like Sri Lanka, both economically um, and politically? And for that conversation, I am joined by Dr. Shamika Jayasundara Smits, um, who's from Sri Lanka, um, and who will shed some light on this. So Shamika, maybe the first question, why is it important to talk about Sri Lanka? Thank you for the question, and uh, why shouldn't we? So I ask a question back. Because we talk about everything else, and we live in a connected world, why not Sri Lanka? So this is a kind of a mistake that we have been doing when we talk about the wars and the narratives of war, because the war is also partly like, you know, constructed discursively. So we need to pay attention to the narratives, who control the narratives, because this is also about power and knowledge. And this is the mistake that we did in the 1990s, 2000s, when a lot of wars were taking place in Africa. It was never like, you know, connected to anything else until the, all the migrants, you know, started kind of, you know, fleeing from boats and coming and making a kind of, you know, issues here. So even in Sri Lanka, you know, this is about the narrative. So that's why even if it's a small country, it is also a sovereign nation. 
with equal kind of you know, right to exist and also taking part in the international order making. So it is very important to share a perspective even though only people kind of, you know, know Sri Lanka for going on nice holidays to sandy beaches even, you know, but it's as an international actor, also a sovereign nation, as I said, it's very important. So for me, it is very troubling for some time not to hear anything about other than this has been a Europe's war. Maybe this will become a world war. Of course, then you get dragged into that story. And also, war is happening here. It's not there. So, and also then the narrative started changing, talking about, oh, the impact on Africa. So it's always like, you know, there is a very particular way this narrative kind of, you know, travels. So that is why I thought I want to make an intervention here to also to bring another perspective, although it's a small country, we are part of the, you know, this shared kind of, you know, uh, interdependent uh, world. Yep. So I think what is happening in Sri Lanka is also quite important for people to know about, maybe not necessarily the war per se, but Sri Lanka is also coming out of a, its own third years of civil war. So I think there are many layers, you know, uh, to think as to why we should be bothered to listen to a story about Sri Lanka, why Sri Lanka should be part of this story. As the question asked about intersectionality, not necessarily gender, yeah. history and these narratives are always like, you know, we say his story, history is a his story. So it's very important to come from a gender, race, class, even, you know, the small countries, big countries, part of become this story. So I think it's a matter of knowledge and power. So that is why I thought important to share this. Thank you for highlighting, fully agree. Um, we've been talking today about the compounding effects of this war on existing challenges. Um, Anna shed extensive light on this already. Um, Sri Lanka was also finding itself in a somewhat turbulent time um, at the time of the onset of this war. Can you maybe share some insights on the socio-economic impacts this war has had on Sri Lanka? Yeah, I think the story of Sri Lanka began before this war because it was coming out of 30 years of civil war and the country never quite transited from a war economy to a peace economy, if you want to make that, uh, you know, kind of a distinction. Um, it was still stuck in that, you know, war mode, the militarism and, you know, in infrastructure, everything was still geared to, like, as if there was a war. So it was very vulnerable, the economy was very vulnerable, and we also have, yes, political leadership, you know, doing things in a very particular way and, you know, running a war at any cost. And of course, it was a victory. So the war economy kind of, you know, stayed for a very long time. And it is like, you know, the, it, the war ended in 2009, uh, in May, but we were still in the war of something. And uh, that had a, like, you know, gets a quite a lot of investment still went into keeping up the military, uh, you know, feeding the military, also infrastructure building, and quite a lot of things happening. So. Before, after that, you had another, like, you know, layer of uh, problems of its own. That is the uh, 2019, the Easter bomb attack. So when Sri Lanka was a little bit trying to recover from it, and then this happened. And Sri Lanka is a country known for, you know, its tourism. Large re revenues comes from the tourism industry, and this really freaked out everybody to go into Sri Lanka. <laughs> and quite a lot of, you know, uh, tour operators canceled, and, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs in the tourism sector, and so on. So now we are, like, you know, in another kind of mess. And then the COVID came. And that, on top of that, yes, of course, again, the tourism were hit, and also the tea exports were hit, and uh, also another very important uh, income source is the remittances from the migrants. And they were sent back and, you know, so we lost that income as well. And of course, the prices in the world market after the COVID was really, you know, skyrocketing. And for Sri Lanka, a country that imports almost all its, like, you know, fuel needs from outside, it was really uh, unaffordable. And also, the government made quite a interesting like you know policy moves that did not 
add anything to like, you know, ease the burden on the economy. So we were living beyond our means, basically. And right. it's a very populist kind of, you know, regime. So there is a particular way that you handle issues. And any economic policy, you kind of, you know, wrap it up in a patriotic tone. And then the people will just be like, you know, very happy to hear it. But on the ground, the coffers were getting really empty. Of course, uh, corruption and you know, the other issues on top of that. So adding up, and then there came the war from Ukraine. And of course, it was far, you know, happening in Europe, the ripple effects of Ukraine war, like the food prices and in the fuel and everything else. And also Sri Lanka depended quite a lot on Russia and Ukraine for its like, you know, wheat imports. Right. And also for tea exports. Right. And also quite a lot of uh, Russians and um, Ukrainian tourists are coming to Sri Lanka. And this all kind of, you know, somehow affected. So it's not the direct impact, but the economy was already very vulnerable. So any outside shock couldn't be absorbed. So then it started really collapsing. It was already collapsing, but it kind of, you know, went flat. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not the, yeah, it's like in Sri Lanka, we say it's like uh, somebody who fell from the tree and hit by a bull. So Sri Lanka was already <laughs> falling from the tree and hit by the bull of this Ukraine, you know, right. conflict. So, um, yeah. Yeah, because you shared a figure with us, right? So 45% um, of Sri Lanka's wheat imports are sourced from Russia and Ukraine. So that reveals um, your vulnerability. Um, and you also shared a picture of the, of the, gas, uh, yes. the gas station and the lines. Um, if I may add one thing, I mean, yeah. Sri Lanka is not a country, even I'm getting shocked to hear that a country that is so much like, you know, uh, prosperous in its, uh, you know, fertile land and everything, how can you go without food? It's also the government policies, as I said, made real big mistakes, particularly introducing almost overnight an organic fertilizer policy. To save the foreign exchange, uh, the dwindling like, you know, foreign exchange, the government introduced this disastrous policy. And on top of that, there was climate kind of, you know, issues that was affecting the crops. So it's a kind of, you know, culmination of everything. And the Ukraine war was the last blow because its yeah. ability to recover became even like, you know, reduced. Yeah. Yeah, you shared a squ uh, quote from Alan Keenan. Yeah. This is the Ukraine effect, a credit line for fuel you thought could last two months, now last one. This was kind of, you know, said in, uh, uh, I think, at the beginning of this crisis uh, with the sh skyrocketing uh, prices in the world market and so, and also um, in relation to uh, Sri Lanka's foreign exchange kind of, you know, diminishing yeah. very fast. Yeah. So, yes, and I think in the Washington Post, they mentioned that Sri Lanka is kind of the like the epicenter of a global economic crisis. So it was the first sign, according to them, because as my colleagues previously said, all these vulnerable countries, you know, economically vulnerable countries were already in debt. Yeah. So the impact kind of, you know, uh, kind of accumulated on top of that kind of, you know, vulnerabilities. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to circle back to Will's presentation. Um, you've already alluded a little bit uh, to the geopolitical repercussions um, at the beginning, um, saying how in geopolitics size doesn't matter. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how Sri Lanka has positioned itself in this conflict? Um, and maybe also whether you think countries like Sri Lanka are or should be interested in saving the current liberal international order? Good question. <laughs> I myself asked that. As far as the geopolitical, like, you know, uh, concerns uh, of Sri Lanka, at the beginning, Sri Lanka wasn't taking any side. And we are very known for that, not taking a side. And we have this from the 1970s. Our foreign policy is um, friends of all, enemy of none. So, and it also goes with our Buddhist philosophy, like, you know, being in the middle path. 
Of course, then it looks like very wishy-washy. But Sri Lanka could not afford to take a strong stand in this conflict, to side with one or the other, because it is a vulnerable country, and it depends on everybody, and it also has a history of, you know, its own foreign policy kind of, you know, uh, paths. And also, in the 1960s, 70s, Sri Lanka has been really benefiting from its relations with uh, Russia, you know, China, all these fighting parties as well as, of course, from the, you know, the liberal West and, you know, these uh, international institutions. So it was a very difficult uh, position that uh, Sri Lanka could not take. But, of course, it played with the international rules and the laws, of course, on that ground, of course, there was a sentiment that, uh, of course, this is wrong. But at the same time, people were asking why this is wrong. How did we end up? in this kind of a situation? How did the West end up in this situation? So then you went back to, you know, the order making, as we call it, back then. It was like a victor's peace that enforced this present system. So people realize, even, you know, uh, there was talk about in Sri Lanka, yeah, it is time, even for a small country like Sri Lanka to intervention in this kind of a debate also using its geostrategic advantage, you know, being situated in the Indian Ocean in a very strategic location to kind of, you know, uh, yeah, from strength, you know, rather than being dismissed as a very small island, you know, of 22 million people, bankrupt economy, we still had things to sell. We still had things to like, you know, get uh, attention to. And particularly with the China's BRI project and the geopolitical alignment in the Indian Ocean region and the Indo-Pacific, Sri Lanka is very well placed to kind of, you know, play its own game for its own benefit. But this is not necessarily taking this side or that side, but also looking at from a very historical point of view, it's, uh, you know, uh, diplomatic relations with all these countries and its old convictions. And also, there is uncertainty about which way this order making is going to go. <laughs> so you have to kind of, you know, uh, play it safe as well. And um, yeah, very strategic. And I think Sri Lanka did not vote. Uh, they, they remain abstained in the uh, UN resolution uh, that uh, uh, wanted to condemn uh, Russia, so it took a stand. But of course, there is always an explanation as to why. India did the same. I think Bangladesh did that, Pakistan did that, because these are the countries that are also depending on what is to be coming in the new order making. And particularly, you know, uh, thinking about China and, you know, Russia and the other uh, South Africa, Brazil, the other countries who will have a much more say and a stake in the new order. So, um, yeah, so Sri Lanka played it safe. Probably, I think, uh, the, the bailout that it was expecting from the International uh, Monetary Fund came faster than uh, slower because it is not a position that uh, Sri Lanka couldn't be um, left out or outside the fear of influence of these big powers, no matter how big they are, they still had to little bit, you know, give attention and to kind of, a, you know, be sensitive, I would say, to the concerns of Sri Lanka because of at least its uh, geostrategic location and the kind of a role it could play in the new order making. So. Right. It's, a, it's a balancing act for Sri Lanka, right? So you're walking a bit of a tightrope. And maybe nice to also share an example that you shared with me about Russian oil and you know, an example of how to you know, navigate between uh, these different countries in this conflict. Yeah, because Sri Lanka couldn't uh, afford at one point at the beginning of this uh, war and also already into an economic crisis. And it also benefited from this war in Ukraine. I mean, there are losers and, you know, winners everywhere. And what happened in Sri Lanka was Sri Lanka didn't have foreign exchange to buy the Russian oil. So there was an oil tanker that was uh, uh, stationed in the sea, couldn't unload 
because we had no money. But then there was a discussion about Russia being cut off from the SWIFT system and Russia had the need to unload it. So then also the Russia wanted to get rid of, you know, it's kind of, you know, oil. And then the 30 dollars a barrel came down, you know, uh, the prices dropped by 30 uh, uh, dollars. And Sri Lanka could afford to kind of, you know, buy. So it made like, you know, these quick moves. And also, although the Western sanctions, I do not know how my colleagues think how effective they are, but the Russia actually diverted its kind of, you know, um, uh, markets to Asia. And so Sri Lanka was buying oil from Russia, sometimes not directly, through India, who bought the oil and gave it to Sri Lanka for a subsidized price, and then also to like, you know, to some of the Gulf state. So Sri Lanka had more opportunities, you know, more avenues to like, you know, navigate this evolving kind of a system to benefit because people had to be fed. Politicians are kind of, you know, still sensitive. And uh, there were many opportunities. Earlier, you had this, you know, very strict rules and regulations, very structured way of going about business. Now, this war, in a way, opened up other possibilities of navigating and working around things. So this is uh, what uh, Sri Lanka did. And I think, um, yeah, uh, it kind of, you know, it was a, our, the need of the hour, I would say, and very pragmatic yeah. thinking on one yeah. hand as well. Yeah. And yeah, why not exploit what is happening, you yeah. know, for the better? Well, thank you for sharing about Sri Lanka and the toxic influence of crisis, really, that your country um, experienced and some of the challenges and dilemmas it brought about. Um, but also for encouraging us to remain critical um, in the narrative about the war. I am looking at Will, I'm looking at Ona to see if you have any additional comments or questions, and otherwise I will give the audience an opportunity. Yeah, Happy? Good. So I would like to call on Gabby again to see if there is anybody here who has a question for Shamika. Yes, I see a hand raised. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Diederik Kramers. I'm involved in uh, the foundation. Oh, sorry. I'm involved in the um, uh, foundation opendoorukraine.nl and following very closely what's happening in Ukraine. Um, I, would, uh, I was wondering, I have two questions regarding, uh, we, uh, the discussion is about uh, the liberal order, but there's also mention of the rule-based order. Um, of course, the liberal order is uh, already for a long time very much on the discussion on how it could offer a more fair share to unrepresented countries from the global south. At the same time, the danger is also that um, the... Um, uh, the, the, what is now going on risks undermining any rules-based initiative or order uh, in the world, especially if we see now that uh, the, uh, one of the permanent representatives in the Security Council, Russia, is itself making itself guilty of uh, uh, attacks on Ukraine uh, and uh, one can say uh, severe violations of human rights, even genocide. So. Um, this risks undermining the whole UN order at the same time, which is also a carrier of notably uh, developments. You, you have in front of you the box with the sustainable development goals. What will be uh, left of that if the UN is losing its authority in this way? Um, and in the presentation on Sri Lanka, I was uh, interested to hear that uh, you described uh, Sri Lanka as a sovereign country with the right to exist. Uh, interestingly, that puts you actually in the same camp as Ukraine, which is also a sovereign country fighting for its right to exist because uh, there is a risk that it, uh, or an intention, one could say, from the Russian side that um, its existence as a state and a nation is not being recognized. In that sense, I fully understand that uh, countries in Global South, like Sri Lanka, are in a, in a difficult situation uh, and that you have, to, you have a responsibility to the people to... Uh, to allow them to survive and subsist. But uh, if you look at um, uh, taking, looking at the opportunities offered by the war in buying Russian oil, 
uh, wouldn't that, couldn't that be seen as making use of blood oil which helps the uh, Russian war machine to continue killing Ukrainians and would it not be tantamount to war profiteering? Sorry for the provocative uh, question, but for the sake of discussion. Very okay. welcome. <laughs> we like provocative questions at ISS, so <laughs> looking at my colleagues, who wants to start? I think I'll take the last bit of your uh, question. The thing is that um, if you look at the Sri Lanka's own war of 30 years, which is very much framed by everywhere as a war without witnesses, so it says a lot about, you know, how you <laughs> treat your, in a way, own, like, you know, minorities and, you know, how this war was fought. And um, at the same time, I'm not sure, like, you know, whether you can only say that this is a blood oil. I think everything else that we have been buying so far was, like, you know, tainted with blood and sweat and, you know, exploitation, you know, there's a whole history about it. I'm not justifying it. We have to be uh, kind of, you know, um, very sensitive and concerned about, you know. But at the same time, people in Sri Lanka were dying because of lack of, you know, fuel supplies, you know. Hospitals couldn't run. The ambulance wasn't, uh, you know, running. So it was a kind of a very pragmatic uh, decision as well. But it's not only Sri Lanka who was buying this oil. People who were fighting them were also like, you know, in the West also, you know, uh, they were still having some business going on with Russia. So why would a country like Sri Lanka only be like, you know, named and shamed that way? Uh, I think we need to a little bit like, you know, broaden the picture. Who does business with whom? And, you know, even if you look at before the war broke out, you know, uh, even uh, Germany, like, you know, does a lot of business with, you know, Russia and European Union, other countries. So I think blood is in everybody's hand in that sense. So um, maybe it is not the most satisfying answer, but it is not maybe a very moral kind of, you know, take on, on this issue. But I think it's good to, like, you know, look at it a little bit more broadly than only Sri Lanka. I wouldn't say it is not. That is, at least personally, I can like, you know, attest. But I think, um, yeah, um, we buy Saudi uh, oil and, you know, the, all the human rights violations. But the global, uh, you know, these interdependencies are as such. You have on one side, you know, these pragmatic relations. On one side, you have this, you know, ideological kind of, you know, uh, a part of it, so, but it's a kind of, you know, mixed picture. It's not uh, very black and white, especially if you are looking from a very small country, extremely vulnerable, and um, yeah, and also the situation in which it got kind of, you know, into with its own war, you know, post-war, and with other, you know, uh, uh, conditions. Yeah, maybe I can add a, uh, a little remark to that about the role of Saudi Arabia. Of course, the regime itself is very questionable, but also uh, while the West buys oil from Saudi Arabia, you could say indirectly they buy also Russian oil. And that's uh, because um, when the, the Russian oil became so cheap, uh, Ukraine, uh, um, Saudi Arabia decided not to use its own oil for the whole country, but to buy cheap Russian oil for its own country and then sell the clean, so to say, uh, Saudi Arabian oil to the West. Uh, so yeah, is that not Russian oil or not? Yeah, that's also uh, dubious. And I think also the West expected like the Global South to, to fall in line. And I think there is also among some of the uh, uh, Middle East countries uh, like Syria, uh, countries in Africa, there is also a bit of a feeling like, okay, when we had big wars, what, where was the West? Uh, like, and, and now it's a European war and now suddenly you expect that it's a global war. Everyone uh, should take sides. I'm not uh, kind of uh, just uh, defending that position, but uh, it's, I think, a reality which we should take into account. Uh. Thank you. I'm going to continue looking at you because there was a second part of the question um, pertaining to, you know, does geopolitics 
um, and pragmatism mean the end of you know the UN or the UN as we know it or the liberal order as we know it is there what is this tension between geopolitics and human rights and how can that be circumvented if at all well, you, you, now you now you're taking the question into uh, a very different uh, dimension I think but what uh, the gentleman here was referring to was let's say to what extent uh, is this well, and I'm now rephrasing your question, but yeah. is this international order a global order? And uh, I think that, um, I mean, we don't have to go that far back into history, but maybe, let's say, to the immediate post-Cold War, uh, post -Cold War period, uh, where there was a call uh, for a changing structure also of the United Nations. Uh, there was a very powerful... Um, international group of people, including our own Jan Pronk, um, the Commission on Global Governance, uh, that brought out a report uh, in uh, the early 1990s in the light of the end of the Cold War on what would a future global governance system need to look like. And the idea here was indeed to have a broader representation in order to enhance legitimacy of the system because already at that stage obviously uh, the uh, the multilateral order was seen very much as if not directly a, a western dominated uh, order but clearly an order that was still very much biased to the immediate post-war power situation uh, so with five permanent members where a lot of countries could not recognize themselves. So I think uh, if we revisit that discussion of the 1990s and, and see the implications uh, in today's uh, world, uh, I think this, this all comes back with a vengeance. Because at that stage, uh, the, the discussion was not uh, done seriously. Yes, there was lip service was paid to the fact that other countries might actually uh, have to be part of the Security Council, uh, or of the permanent members of the Security Council, sorry. Uh, but it was never really um, uh, done in a serious way. And there were proposals, for instance, to change uh, the seats of the two European permanent members, namely France and the UK, into an EU uh, seat. That would have maybe brought up uh, a change, or that would would have brought into force a change uh, in in the discussion on potential new members. Now, I'm not saying that um, uh, the UN Security Council uh, is is such an enormously important body that you know the whole world will stop uh, turning when it takes a decision. No, not far from that. But it's highly symbolic uh, because it is the one single universal. Uh, global organization that we have. Uh, the rest are either in sectors or they are not universal. Um, so the symbolic nature of that discussion, I think, was, was not recognized sufficiently. Um, and, and that led uh, to the kind of stalemate that we still have. And so if you bring forward, so how do we look at the current liberal international order as a predominantly uh, a rules-based order where the rules have been set primarily uh, in the West, yeah, I think you have a point. But now might be the time actually to do something about that. And maybe uh, the current insights uh, that are gained from the way in which this war is being dealt with might actually lead to some changes. Thank you. I'm looking at the audience to see if there are any more questions. I see a hand, two hands. Uh, yeah, I had a question for Shamika because you were talking about different narratives and how the war is being framed. And so I was wondering in Sri Lanka, given this very recent history of a war itself, does that recent civil war impact how the war in Ukraine is being kind of perceived in Sri Lanka? Thank you for the question. 
There's no one position that is one of the, I wouldn't say issue, that is LD, I would say. Then you have to like, you know, uh, talk uh, to each other. And uh, when it comes to um, Ukraine, the right to exist as a country is very much the kind of, you know, the official narrative and also from the people's point of view. Because what happened in Sri Lanka is also a civil war where the territory was contested. And uh, so you could really see that, you know, if you let all the territories that were kind of, you know, forged and, you know, made into sovereign nations and through certain process to let it go left and right, you know, with the military aggression, this and that, then you could imagine, you know, things falling apart everywhere. So because everybody would be like, you know, heading back to kind of, you know, disintegration. So official narrative is that in, indeed, you know, you have to preserve the like, you know, uh, the Ukraine as a nation. And also it is not only because of ideological reasons, also pragmatic reasons. So, but I, I haven't heard that anybody, you know, uh, who is saying that, yes, you need to have a war to settle this. Of course, at the beginning it was okay, like, you know, because Sri Lanka is very much uh, tuned to the society also in a way to this militarism and, you know, but probably after 10 years of winning nothing at the end of the war, people realize that wars don't win anything at the end of the day. It's only kind of, you know, create losers. So, and also the case of Ukraine is kind of, you know, compelling in a way because there are parallels to Sri Lanka, its own trajectory of, uh, you know, state kind of, you know, uh, building and also in relation to this territorial disputes. So, um, yeah, but there is no single position, but there is a dominant kind of, you know, official as well as like, you know, supported by people, the existence of Ukraine, you know, that narrative was supported, but also in a way like, you know, there are other things happening in the Indian Ocean and that region where these territorial disputes are, you know, very much in people's kind of, you know, um, parameters of thinking. So it's different calculations, you know, uh, go into constructing a narrative and taking a position. But uh, all in all, I can say that, of course, different positions, but this is what that is being supported. And I think it's the, also the policy of the government. But of course, how do you do it without like, you know, messing up with uh, Russia, the pragmatic relations going into the history of this, you know, long time, you know, historical, very friendly diplomatic relations and so and so. So it is a balancing act and also without antagonizing China. It's also like, you know, one of the major creditors to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka owes seven billion, like, you know, uh, dollars to, uh, and also not messing up with India. So all these people who are fighting the nations are Sri Lanka's uh, kind of, you know, <laughs> we owe them uh, quite a lot of money, as well as we have very friendly past relations and also going into future relations. So the narrative also kind of, you know, gets shaped looking into, you know, different aspects of these different relationships. Right. I saw another hand before. Um, so, it works, yeah. Um, I wanted to frame my question in the, in, yeah, in the side of the international relations. So the way I see it, and I think it was also a bit uh, questioned here, that the United Nations, it has been, uh, kind of established after the Second World War and primarily by the winners of the Second World War. So it's, um, to me, it's always strange to hear uh, like United Nations being like this uh, united or you think it's just the, yeah, the countries that won uh, the Second World War. And right now, for better or worse, we are in the stalemate, right, with the Security Council that was addressed already multiple times with multiple speakers. And I think we are witnessing like the, the impotence of the UN because, yeah, it's not that it would change everything in the world, but it is a highly symbolic gesture. So I was wondering, um, is there any fresh ideas, any, anything that is happening in the international relations that would truly 
potentially at least offer some new perspectives. Is it, um, it could be of course in the re reform in the UN or something completely new or, yeah, what, what are the ideas? Thanks. Go ahead. Probably I, I, should, I should say something, not, not that I know uh, all that much uh, of, of the internal workings of the UN, but one of the things uh, that's ironic is that uh, the UN was established in 1944, the end of the Second World War. Um, and, yeah, since the beginning of the Cold War, so depending a little bit on when you date that, but let's say uh, uh, 1946, 1947, the United Nations was actually the disunited nations. Uh, because as soon as uh, the, um, the Cold War started, there was no agreement between the two superpowers on almost anything. So for a very long time, uh, definitely between 19... 1940s and the beginning of the 1990s, the UN Security Council was not able to decide uh, because there was always either the Soviet Union or uh, the United States um, exercising their veto uh, because the Security Council can't decide apart from a situation where there's the concurring vote, as they call it, of the five permanent members. Um, so, what's, what's the opportunity? Uh, yeah, I think it, it very much would depend on how this war ends. Huh? And now, of course, there are many scenarios that, that are currently discussed on how this war might, war might end. It might end with a sort of Russian defeat. Well, nobody really knows what that would look like, but Maybe it would be a withdrawal from the occupied Donbass uh, and or Crimea, possible. Uh, although there are also speculations that then there has to be some sort of deal struck, uh, for instance, regarding Sevastopol, which is the major um, navy base of, of Russia. Um, but okay, so let's leave that aside. That's one possible outcome. But the other outcome would be uh, an a continuing occupation of part of Ukraine. Now that might very easily result in a new Cold War uh, because that would lead to a new division, uh, particularly where so many people have over the past year or so emphasized that Ukraine represents European values. Uh, so if that is the case and a part of Ukraine remains occupied, that might easily re result in, in a sort of new Cold War, which would then possibly again bring back that same disunited nations that we've seen for at least 40 years um, during the Cold War period. So, um, yeah, where, where does that bring me? Well, I'm, I'm not so optimistic actually about uh, the United Nations to, uh, as a sort of... Um, well, what's, the, uh, what's the, the phrase that we normally use? The Baron von Munchausen, uh, the, the, the guy who is in the swamp and has to pull himself out of the swamp by his own hair. Well, that's not a very successful enterprise. So that might very well be the, the situation that the UN finds itself in because ultimately any reform of the UN Charter depends on the acceptance of changes by those same permanent members. So unless uh, there is a, a miracle happening where those would say, okay, we give up our right uh, of the veto. Uh, there, there were proposals among others by the Commission on Global Governance that I've just mentioned where the permanent members would say, okay, we retain the veto, but we won't exercise it. That's, that's I think, a highly idealistic uh, uh, issue. Or the other uh, opportunity would be to increase the number of permanent members. That would only result in an enhancement of, of the, or the potential enhancement of the use of the veto, not, then not just by five, but maybe by ten permanent members. So. Unless there is a miracle uh, happening where this whole uh, construction would be given up, 
uh, we run the risk that we get back into a stalemate, as you, as you call it, uh, of uh, yeah, an, an, uh, an impotent um, a United Nations organization. Because in the end, uh, it is an intergovernmental organization, so it doesn't have any power uh, in and of itself. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's, that's maybe the sobering uh, conclusion that, that we could come to uh, uh, in 2023. I got a warning sign from outside that I need to watch the time. <laughs> so, I want to take the conversation back. Um, and I want to take it to a higher level. I mean, we've heard all of your three perspectives. We've had additional insights from the questions that were raised by the online audience and the live audience. I guess we could say the overall picture is relatively bleak. Um, now we have this convergence of multiple crises. It's compounding pre-existing uh, crises. Um, we have stories from the sideline that reveal um, hidden profiteering, uh, systemic shortcomings that exist, international organizations that are less effective, but you know, that we're questioning maybe altogether their legitimacy. Um, countries are being pushed over the edge, um, trying to walk a, a fine line, really. And all of this in the context of many, many unknowns of what's about to happen. So I have two questions to kind of wrap up the discussion today. The first one is, what are the most, impor the most important lessons we can learn? Does anybody want to shed light on that? Yeah, I can uh, start. Um, I guess one uh, regarding uh, more in the area of food and one more, more general. Um, I think what uh, uh, the food is a kind of, uh, the food problematic is, is a kind of angle in, into the wider geopolitics where they're happening and it's, it makes it very visual, be, uh, visible because yeah, it's so important for everyone uh, of us. And um, um, I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, looking at the West, for example, there, um, there is a lot. I, I'm wondering uh, whether it's a very uh, good stance um, to use an organization like the Food and Agriculture Organization to push China or the Secretary General for a political stance on security. Yeah? Um, I think it's, it's, of course, you would like that, but I think it's not a fora for that. That, that should be in the, the, the general UN, yeah? or the Security Council, but they are not in there, but then via the, the general UN. Uh, if you do that, I think it's a bit short-sighted. Uh, yeah, it shows your moral high ground and, and you would like everyone to, to take that position maybe, but it, it just uh, makes this organization inefficient, yeah? And if you politicize as the West, what, then you cannot expect from other countries to also to uh, not make it uh, very politicized, yeah? Of course, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an utopia to think of this organization as completely devoid of politics, but at least you can try to minimize it. Uh, so I think uh, there is something because we tend to think about what China all those wrong and, and, and Russia and we should look at that but we have more impact on what we do ourselves uh, in the West. Um, so that's uh, one thing and also in terms of uh, yeah this bleak story uh, is it just lose-lose? I think um, what we probably will see that uh, some countries may fare well when they are very strategically positioned and poor but they are strategically positioned uh, maybe on, uh, because, uh, because of, of, of the, the, the new Silk Road, because of the new uh, internet cables. Uh, so certainly then some poor countries might have uh, all kinds of donors waiting in line to help them, yeah? Where others are, uh, will drop behind. So I think we see, we'll see much more differentiation in, in the global south uh, in that respect. That's my, uh, my expectation. Thank you. Shamika. I think um, a lesson learned here is also to take this interdependency of the countries, you know, uh, and the people to people also more seriously. Because when the order was making, it had a, like, you know, uh, a particular history, you know, how it came about after the war. 
there was not much of, you know, interdependency with the willingness. There was forced kind of, you know, inclusions, the exclusions, the marginalization. So I think it's important to take this interdependence a little bit more seriously in the, you know, uh, coming uh, world order making. And also to, uh, for the regional orders to kind of, you know, to let them also flourish, but not at a gunpoint, because that is not going to work, but also through uh, deliberation and, you know, very democratic process. So I think uh, the situation is ripe when the UN is also, you know, running out of its steam and, you know, the countries do not look for it. And we can see that already the regional organizations have revived in this conflict, even trying to like, you know, negotiate a peace between these uh, big fighters. <laughs> and they have the guts to do so, but they need to be like, you know, included and also to think about as equal partners. And for Sri Lanka in particular, I would say the lesson learned is do your homework and fix your home you know, then you can withstand this kind of, you know, external shocks. When your house is in disarray, yeah, then what do you expect? So I think this is also a lesson for some other uh, smaller countries, much more vulnerable, how to reduce that vulnerability, which is not like, you know, completely uh, due to external factors, but mostly domestic, political, like, you know, issues. So I would say, yeah, there are quite a lot of different fronts that uh, you can, uh, uh, yeah, make improvements. Thank you. We've been looking backwards. We've been looking at, oh, sorry, Will, did you want to? No, uh, not necessarily, but uh, I thought you, you, you would want uh, that. I think, uh, well, if you look at Europe, uh, you, you, you gave a quote of uh, our prime minister saying that this is a watershed moment. I think that, um, let's say, in Europe, uh, people have now come to realize that uh, we can't be outside of uh, 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 the power politics. And so the European Union has uh, for a very long time pretended that it is not um, a global power. Um, economically, it was accepted, uh, but politically, uh, that, that was not. I think that has hit home very hard now uh, with this war, that it's inescapable somehow that... Uh, the European Union not only builds some sort of political identity, but also starts to act like it is uh, a political identity, or has enough political identity. Yeah. You've already answered a little bit my next question, um, all of you in, in that regard, um, because we don't only want to talk about the lessons, we also want to look forward a little bit. and make this jump from analysis, which Shamika likes to say can lead to paralysis if you overdo it, um, and make the jump from analysis to a vision and towards action. So you've already raised some points, but after listening to all of this, what is your final take? What is the most important thing from your perspective that needs to be changed? I may say, as I said earlier also, wars do not uh, create winners, you know. Everybody loses if you look at it from a very human kind of, you know, perspective. And uh, we should come back to like, you know, democratic, agonistic way of doing politics rather than let the metal speak, so to say. So resolving this conflict that is armed conflict in Ukraine is not going to resolve lot of other conflicts. So we are very embedded, interconnected, and you know, we, there's a kind of, you know, uh, yeah, we are all tangled in this together. So finding one solution to that conflict alone is not gonna like, you know, take us uh, much further in terms of visioning like, you know, a peaceful future. I think we should invest in like, you know, I would say uh, very bluntly and you know, uh, we should find ways to like, you know, wipe the, you know, uh, war from uh, the human history and try to like, you know, um, make, uh, yeah, plans for that. How to eliminate war and how to eliminate this militarized confrontation. Of course, there are entrepreneurs like, you know, who are benefiting from it, but war is not what is kind of, you know, needed. Look at COVID, what it did to like, you know, people. 
look at the other issues. I mean, it's all kind of, you know, taking us back in our, like, you know, uh, progress and everything that we believe. So we, it, war is not a necessity, but of course, when international relations theory, of course, there is a one side saying, give war a chance, and the other says, give peace a chance. I would very much go with give uh, peace a chance. Thank you. Very warm and uh, inspirational words. Ona, do you have any comments? Yeah, so let me stress another aspect rather than preventing war, which I'm of, of course in full agreement with, um, but which is also partly in uh, 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 security studies uh, problematic, yeah, and in terms of where is really the expertise of development studies in my, my, my view or in my field is uh, very much in, yeah, once what is happening in the, the phase of yeah, development once the war is, uh, has st uh, stopped, yeah, or at least uh, there is a kind of stalemate. And um, I think um, uh, it's important to think for, for especially here in, in the case of Ukraine, think ahead, yeah, uh, not be only obsessed with, uh, uh, with the moment, yeah, whether we provide uh, um, fighter jets, etc., which is a very important discussion. But also think ahead, yeah. Because if you think about, for example, Iraq after uh, after the war, there was uh, basically almost no plan, yeah, how to rebuild the country. And even there was an intern who had to design uh, the, the 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 traffic policy for whole of Baghdad, yeah. Uh, so uh, that doesn't seem like a good re recipe for uh, rebuilding and preventing another war or another crisis. Um, so I think that's important to think ahead, even it, if it looks very far in the future, uh, but to think about how to design it and how to involve the, the relevant uh, stakeholders, the, the population in that process. Thank you. Will, final words? Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm tempted to, to align with Shamika, but uh, I, I'm afraid that the reality is simply not uh, such that, that we can uh, lean back and think, okay, so we can have uh, easy solutions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that also in this continent uh, we will be facing uh, choices that, uh, uh, that, that lead to um, um, alignments maybe that, that we don't that we've never uh, thought of, um, of engaging in. Um, so Henry Kissinger, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, said, well, one of the things that uh, might be necessary is to extend NATO membership to Ukraine. Uh, that, that would definitely lead to a new kind of uh, confrontation or at least uh, division uh, on, on the European continent. I, I don't rule that out, that that is uh, an ultimate uh, uh, decision uh, somehow in the next couple of years, given the situation uh, that, uh, that we're in and also given the situation that Ukraine is in. So I, I think that uh, we need to prepare for a new type of relationships uh, in, in this European continent uh, where maybe uh, lessons that we learned in the past, uh, confidence building measures, uh, opening up uh, more contact among people, uh, etc., would would be uh, very important uh, to avoid that this uh, confrontation uh, will will lead in the next decade or so to a to a new uh, war in Ukraine. Right. right. Thank you. I'm looking at the time. We need to wrap this up. Um, there's so much more to discuss to this topic and we've only covered so much, but already there's so much to digest um, and to reflect upon. Um, this is the end of our event today, uh, the final episode in our first series of Research Insights Live. I want to invite you to visit um, two websites on the ISS website, or two pages on the ISS website. Um, you can stay tuned on more related to this event on the Research Insights Live page. The link is on the screen. Um, and if you're interested in getting some of the latest um, highlights from ISS research on global development and social justice more broadly, um, I kindly refer you to our Research Insights page. Um, I want to thank the speakers, each one of you, Shamika, Ona, Will, 
uh, for your thought-provoking insights, um, for sharing the lesser heard stories, maybe the less popular stories as well, and for, again, reminding us to remain critical um, as we talk about this war and um, analyze its repercussions. I also want to thank the organizing team from ISS who's made this possible. And um, this is the end of today's event, at least for the online audience. Um, for the live audience, I invite you to continue the conversations um, in the network drinks that will follow now. So thank you very much.